All right, we're recording, and here we go. All right, so this is week five of our study on the book of James, and we are done with chapter one. <laughs> Who'd have thought it taken us four weeks to get through James chapter one? Uh, tonight we're we're starting on chapter two. The topic is love and the law. And uh, as I was reading through this and reading through the quarterly this week, uh, I saw there was a little bit of correlation there. Because, uh, uh, of course, the lesson this week on the quarterly was loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So it fit in really well. But uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll dive right into the study. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for bringing us to another Sabbath. As we enter the Sabbath hours with a, a time of study, Lord, we ask you'll send your spirit to be with us, guide us in our study, lead us to truth, and give us understanding, Lord, and then help us to apply these truths to our lives. We thank you for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So love and the law. There we go. All right. So it, we start off. We're going to look at James 2.13. I have the verse up here on the screen. Uh, for those of you here in the building, folks that are watching on home can't see that, you'll have to look it up in your Bible. But James 2.13 says, For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I thought it was kind of an interesting text for a study on love in the law, but it talks, it starts off about talking about judgment and no mercy, but then ends with mercy triumphs over judgment. What we're going to try to do tonight is decipher this text. What goes on? I mean, do we believe that judgment will be without mercy? No, but you notice the, the condition it says here, to one who has shown no mercy. So if you have not shown any mercy, you should not expect mercy. That goes, it does go hand in hand with what Jesus said on the, on the issue. Um, so it's it just an interesting text to start with. And of course, he ends with mercy triumphs over judgment. So I think we're going to be talking a lot about how mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, it doesn't say there is no judgment, but it just says that mercy will triumph over that. Because we know if we face the judgment without mercy, what will we all deserve? Yeah, we'd be, we'd be like that 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 servant that wanted to throttle yeah throttle the the people that owed him money. Yeah, we would we'd be cast out. There'd be no hope. All right, so let's start digging into James chapter two with verses one through four, and it's an interesting lead in after uh, how he finished chapter one. Remember at the end of chapter one, he was talking about pure and undefiled religion is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And then we move into this opening here in chapter 2. All right, so do I have a volunteer you'd like to read? James 2, verses 1 through 4. Rodney? All right, go ahead. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. For if there come unto the assembly a man with a gold ring, it could be a pair of and there come in also a poor man in file raiment. <clears throat> and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in the good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judge unto the law, evil thought? All right. So, interesting scenario. Now, what is going on here? In this scenario here, what issue is James addressing? Looking on the outward appearance. And Looking on the outward appearance, right? So we've all seen, you know, if you go to church, you know, we, if we have a visitor who comes in, nice, repeat suit, 
driving a nice car and all that big smile on his face and you know he's he's pulling out bills for the offering plates you know we like to talk to that person <laughs> pastor's going to be sure he shakes his hand not that the pastor is showing partiality he does shake everyone's hand well he's going to he's going to shake his hand and make sure he talks to him because he's a visitor not because of how he's dressed but here it's a it's a completely different situation and you have you know it talks about the person who comes in who's poor filthy clothes person's probably living on the streets and if he comes in to worship and they're talking here about uh saying here stand here or sit here telling them where to sit so you know s- sit down in the back row mm-hmm. right stay out of the camera shot you know and or sit here uh, at my footstool now my bible used the word partiality in my version as opposed to respect because you know we're going to respect everybody but uh, here it's talking about respecting one person and not respecting another because of their outward appearance. And then, uh, of course, the reason that was happening, that was the cultural expectation in society. Remember, James was addressing the, the church as a whole. A lot of the church at this point in time was, were coming from Greek Roman society where you had expectations if somebody... Uh, was well off or well to do they were a higher social class they were to be treated differently and if somebody came and gave a huge donation to a cause uh, they would expect some kind of preferential treatment Uh, i don't know how we would do that in a church like this if something like that were to happen Uh, i've seen it in other churches where that person uh, gets I don't know if you'd say power in the church because of his money to where, you know, they kind of defer to what that person wants because if they make him mad, he might not give anymore. And then they can't do some of their programs. You know, our, our program should never be dependent upon the, the whims of the individuals. Yeah, it, have anonymous patients, like the widow who went mm-hmm. secretly went off to put her coins in. But should be anonymous, not to be observed as a, as a, a writer or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for uh, many years, I would not write my name on the tithe envelope and I'd only put cash in there because, uh, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want people judging me based on how much or how little I gave. And then, uh, of course, once I got on the board and found out that we don't, at least in our church, we don't look at that information. Uh, they track it because legally, you know, we have to track it. Um, and Carmen has that information, our treasurer. But uh, I've never had a pastor here say, let's pull out the books and make sure so and so is paying his 10%. Uh, you know, we do at nominating committee look to see who is, you know, con- contributing financially to the work of the church, but we don't look at how much they're contributing. Just are they paying tithe? Are they not? You know, things of that nature, um, which is an expectation you should expect for someone who sits on the board. But we don't we don't grade them. You know, we don't go through. Well, this person gives a lot. This person doesn't give any. Um, and we've even noted in times where people who we know have given in the past and fallen on hard times, and they and it dropped off. You know, we, well, we know there's a reason for that. It's not because. Uh, you know, they're, they're no longer faithful. This person hasn't had income for six months. So you know, you, 10% of nothing is still nothing. God doesn't expect you to give what you don't have. So, but in their society, it was a totally different story. Totally different. And Jesus addressed this uh, even in the church in Jerusalem, as we're going to see here. We're going to look at a couple of texts uh, in Mark uh, 216 and Luke 1143. So I get two volunteers. Okay. You've got Mark? All right. Tyann's got Luke. All right. So go ahead. Let's, yeah, Mark 216. the Pharisees and together. We began saying to the disciples, 
Why is he feeding and drinking tax gatherers and sinners? All right. So, what was Jesus doing that got the Pharisees all upset? Hanging out with the wrong crowd. Hanging out with the wrong crowd, right? Uh, yeah. Tax collectors who were really frowned on. I mean, they're in many ways we we tease people. I've known some really good people who work for the IRS, but we we have a very negative view in our society of the IRS for some unknown reason. Uh, stressing unknown for any government monitors who might be observing this broadcast. <laughs> but uh, in that day, they were considered to be enemies because a lot of the tax collectors in that day would abuse their power. They would collect more than they were required to. Um, so they were considered to be social outcasts. Um, and what was the other category? Okay. Sinners, right? Sinners. Now imagine that. Pharisees were supposed to be religious people. And these are religious people who did not want to speak to sinners. Now, Pastor, how hard would it be to do your job without speaking to sinners? Well, I, you know, if I didn't have to talk, I guess I'd... <laughs> I, mean, I think I feel like I'd probably be very effective. Yeah, not very effective, right? Yeah, because... And you look at the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders. They're supposed to be leading people to truth. And, of course, the people you're leading are all sinners. Uh, so they were looking at, uh, well, we don't hang out with people who aren't perfect, was their view of things. Yeah, they thought they were perfect. So if you weren't up to their standards, they were not going to associate with you. And anyone who did associate with that person was, by association, guilty of the same things and placed at the same standards which is a pretty rough way to do things. Um, if we look, and they go even further, if you look at the verse in Luke, which Tyann's going to read for us, Luke eleven forty three, it goes beyond even that. Most you love the chief seats, the synagogues, where special greetings in the marketplaces. All right, so not only did they not want to associate with those other people, but they expected to receive preferential treatment. Can you imagine what that'd be like if the elders came into the church here and demanded that kind of treatment? I think uh, next nominating committee came around, we probably would have different elders. I, I would hope so. I would hope so. Uh, yeah, but preferential seats, you know, they wanted the best seats in the house. They wanted everyone looking up to them as me being the pillars everyone look up for them. They wanted the special greetings. They wanted people to know who they were and to give them credit when they saw them in public. Now, how do these expectations that they have conflict with the principles of the gospel? If you think about that. The gospel says we're to serve, not be served. Serve, not be served, right? Definitely. I mean... Oh, you should love them too, but yeah. <laughs> Exclusive and self-centered, but we know when you read the gospel, right? It, you look at John 3, 16, right? For God loved all the world, right? God loved the world, all the world, everybody, right? No, nobody's excluded. The only way you get excluded from the gift he has is if you choose to exclude yourself. If you reject it, what they were doing here was segmenting society into people who they would accept and people who were just rejected. That's why they had the problems with the Samaritans and, and the Romans and virtually everyone else who wasn't a pure Jew um, as, as they looked at it. So they were definitely looking to exclude rather than include. Now, we know that we're not as crass about it, as open about it as they were. Uh, hopefully not. I know that I have visited churches where it kind of felt like that um, when I was much younger. I probably came in looking a little bit like that, that filthy person. Not that I was filthy, but I I've, no, I didn't look like the person in the three-piece suit and all that. What is crass? Crass? Crass is uh, like uncouth, uh, 
just not yeah totally not polite just over the top in, in as far as, as that goes <laughs> completely disrespectful yeah so you know we we see people come in and we see people all different walks of life uh you know because jesus reaches out to everybody you have you could have someone who come in who's maybe went to an ivy league school and is brought up on the right side of the tracks and lived in a big house with a big yard drives a nice cars has a nice clothes and he can come in right behind some guy who may be uh you know recovering alcoholic or ex biker um you know a recovering uh, addict you know we see all kinds of people um and we should treat them all the same right we love them all you know we we love to see every everybody that walks through that door and i'm glad i can see that here at this church when we have a visitor come in i don't think i've ever seen anyone not any anyone we have out there in the lobby not go talk to somebody um and we have seen lately some people come through who were uh, right out of prison uh, trying to get their lives together i know since you talked to some some that you knew i think um i don't know if i'm a good player but i did speak okay i thought maybe they might have come from your neighborhood or something because as someone said that they thought that you knew each other and i said well that was cool that he was here to talk to him um that was a, that was a lady that came mm -hmm. she just got out of um, she was in prison or wherever she lived. yeah but see we treat everybody everybody the same and that's how it should be um but you know did we start that way or how do we learn to spot that deficiency in ourselves so that we can deal with it Pray God to show it to you. Yeah. Oh, He will show it to you. Now, the interesting thing is, the the closer you get to God, the more you recognize your faults, which which makes you makes it seem funny because it seems like uh, the more you get into the light, you know, the worse you you look to in your own eyes. Uh, but that's not a bad thing because you're not depending on how you look. Uh, you're not depending on your own abilities you're depending on god so that's a good thing All right so let's move down to the next couple of verses after reading what james wrote here so obviously showing preference to one person over is not is not a good thing let's look at verses five and six and see where he goes from there verse five and six do i have someone who'd like to read that pastor's got it okay Listen, my beloved brother, has God not chosen the poor things, the poor of this world, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. All right, so interesting here. So he's expanding now. It's not just saying how we shouldn't show preferential treatment here, but he said that God is specifically reaching out to the poor people. Now, he doesn't say that he's excluding the rich, but he's making a special attempt, special effort to reach the poor, and he's made promises to the poor. If you read the Beatitudes, Jesus had a lot to say about the poor the needy, uh, the people who would have been considered outcasts by the Pharisees. And he says in here, um, he's chosen them to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him. Now, is there anything in there that would exclude anyone who was not poor? No, he's just saying that he has specifically included them. And then in verse 6, it says, but you have dishonored the poor man. So you're dishonoring someone who God is reaching out to. That's what he's telling them. And then he points out that do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the court. So even in the church, the people who were oppressing the people that they looked down on, they were being looked down on by other people at the same time because there were tears in the society. 
every tier above you look down on you and everyone below you. And I guess you were trying to get as, as far up that pier, up those tiers as you could go so that you wouldn't have that many people looking down on you. But in their society, there was not a whole lot of movement up and down. It was very hard to move up and down. Uh, and even if you did move up, the people who were in that tier before would look on you as someone who did not belong because you weren't born into it. So he, in many ways, when he's writing this, it sounds like he's calling them hypocrites because they're guilty of the thing that they're, uh, of giving out the same kind of treatment they're receiving from people who have dishonored them. Right, let's go down to verse 7. In verse 7, he goes even further, and he says, Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Now, who is he talking about? Who here is blaspheming the name? I think it's important to get straight here. Who, who is actually doing the blasphemy? Probably, probably the Jews or those who don't accept Christianity. Those who don't accept Christianity? Right, it's, it's talking here, just before that he says, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. Um, before that, of course, you've dishonored the poor man. Now he's saying they, so he's not intending this to be the readers, or he would have said you. So he said they, so the people who oppress the believers are guilty of blaspheming the noble name. Now, what does blaspheme mean? Um, I thought it was an interesting word for him to use there. Say something against God. They they always say that. They do it always saying that Christ was not the the Messiah. Right. So, however, they were they were accusing also the Jesus that if he, he they were going to blast him, he say that he was the son of God. So yeah, because Jesus was accused of blaspheming because he claimed mm -hmm. uh, some of the authority mm -hmm. that that only God had. Now it wasn't blasphemy because Jesus did have that authority, so there was nothing wrong with that. Now if I claim that, or any other mortal man claim that, there'd be an issue. But for Jesus to claim it was perfectly natural. So when they're here, they're blaspheming against the name. Uh, it said here, they blaspheme that noble name by which you are called. So they're speaking against the name. So by looking down on them, by oppressing them, the people that God has called, the people that God has made all these promises to, he's given them the kingdom, made them the heirs. Right? So they're claiming, they're claiming the rights that these people have been given instead of uh, allowing them to have it. It's, it's a little odd, I thought, that he used that particular word. But that's really all I can see in there. They're not on the or rules for the king, the king rules all. Yeah. Because see, the noble name by which they're called, well, they're called Christians, right? They're called by Christ's name. Um, so when they're oppressing them, they're oppressing Christ through them, right? So they're speaking against God by speaking against his people, by attacking his people. Uh, and by contrast here, by stating that, right, if, if we do the same thing to other people, what does that make us guilty of? We are going to be Christians. Right. If we are claiming to be Christians, but we are not living like Christians, is that blasphemy? Yeah. Because yeah. you're claiming something that God has, has supposedly given but you're not Living. not really living it like you're it's a complicated complicated way to think but think about how serious that is right what is what is the one sin that that the bible really speaks strongly against 
The one thing that that was the unforgivable sin was blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, right? Or hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, yeah. Now, does that mean that if I'm speaking and acting like that right now, that I can't change and be saved? No. I mean, look at Paul. Right? He was not just speaking against; he was going around executing or, or leading them to execution. Holding the coats as Stephen was stoned. So the danger there is that if you ignore that and you turn away and you speak with it, you may get to the point where you don't hear the pleadings anymore. So these people, if they continue down this path and they continue to dishonor these people, right, they're going to get that, that, that heart's going to turn to stone, right? Their ears are going to get deaf to the pleading of the Holy Spirit, and eventually they're not going to see anything wrong with it. And they're not going to have any desire to change, and they will put themselves in a place where they will be lost. That's what I get out of that when I read that word blaspheme, because he's trying to make a big point, and I think it's important that we stress that, because we have a lot of Christians today who believe they can come to church once a week, whatever day they go, I'm not going to say we don't have people in our church that is just as guilty as as people in others. Uh, You know, they come and they have that hour-long worship service. They sing their praise. They put that check in the tithe envelope or drop the change in or whatever it is they do. And then they go home and live their life like it's just any other day. Right. And, And there's no change in them. And they live just like the rest of the world. And those people are living in a lost state and many of them aren't aware of it so james is pointing out the danger that that attitude can lead you to anyone else have any other viewpoints on that any other insights i don't claim to have all the insights as y'all know i just realized i keep stepping off to the side my camera's catching the side of my head so i should center this a little bit better any other thoughts um, it reminds me of the show I, I watch um, that kind of portrays it really good about the Pharisees on they came to save him. And they felt like they were the children of Abraham, but he needed to save him. They didn't need deliverance. They didn't need healing because they were children of Abraham. It's like something bigger than Abraham is here. Um, I think a good example of that is uh, Nicodemus. Mm-hmm. who was a Pharisee. I mean, the whole conversation he had with Jesus where Nicodemus is coming in and in there with that opinion yeah. of himself, right? That he's a child of Abraham, doesn't need all that. And Jesus is telling him that he needs to be born again. And he goes through that long discussion, which was great discourse. But that shows that Jesus loved the Pharisees. And there were, as we read through the Bible, there were several places where it tells us that some of the Pharisees became believers. Mm-hmm. Nicodemus was just one of them. So Jesus could reach anybody if they will allow him. Right. That's a good, uh, was a good insight. All right, so let's look at some texts about loving our neighbors. And this is going to tie in quite a bit with what we're studying for Sabbath school this week. But we're going to look at James 2, 8 and 9. And then we're going to go back to the Old Testament to show that loving your neighbors is not a New Testament command. And then we're going to look at uh, something in Matthew. So do I have, I'll I'll read James 2, 8, and 9. Do I have a volunteer for Leviticus? All right, right here we have Leviticus 19, uh, verses 17 and 18. And then Matthew 5, Vince, all right, verses uh, chapter 5, 43 through 44, 5. All right, so I'm going to start with James 2, 8 and 9. Just picking up where we left off. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, now the royal law is given by who? Jesus, Jesus, right? God, it's a royal law, so it came from the king. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality... You commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 
All right. So let's look now at Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not reason frankly with your neighbor, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. All right. So who is giving that command? Right. It says, I, I am the Lord, right? So it's the Lord. It's coming from God. And he says in there that you should love your neighbor. Right? It had a whole lot to, to say about not hating, right? And getting that out of there. So he covered it from both angles. Right. And uh, let's go to Matthew. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your, your neighbor. And he's your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in day. For he calls his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sins reign on the righteous and the unjust. All right. So from that text, what view do we get of God concerning not just his people, but even those who would be considered enemies to God? He loves them all. He loves them all, right? He sends them blessings just like he does us, right? He sends them the sunshine and the rain, right? You don't drive through the countryside and see a storm cloud come through and it rains on this field. He's a, a good Christian, goes to church, you know, pays his tithe and all that. But the guy across the street, you know, hasn't been to church in six years, um, doesn't believe in God's turned his back on him and his field is just withering in the sun, right? It doesn't work that way, right? He sends the rains. He sends the sunshine. Uh, everybody receives the same care from God. Right? He doesn't leave anyone to perish. Right. So I think it's important so that the reason, if you put all that together, what is a good reason we should love our neighbor? We'll get into who our neighbor is in a minute. What's a good reason based on what we just read? Because God does. Right, because God does, right? Mm -hmm. Right? How weird would it be for us to claim to be followers of God and to hate something that he loves? Think about a, a marriage relationship. How would that work in a marriage if, uh, say, as a man, I'm going to say the husband hates something that his wife really loves? Yeah, it causes him stress, some strain, mm -hmm. right? And these days, many marriages would end up, you know, failing over that issue. Right? So you can't have that close relationship and hate something that the other person loves. Just not going to work. Now, it's not saying you have to love every dish they like, things of that nature. Right? I'm not going to convince the pastor he needs to eat sweet potatoes. <laughs> right? Still love the pastor, but I know he doesn't like them. And I don't think that's an issue in his household. I, I seriously doubt it. Right? So, but if God loves them, that should be all we need to know. He loves them, so we should love them. Show them the same respect that he shows us. Right. And then, of course, Jesus' life's the greatest example we'll ever have of selfless love. Now, we will probably not be capable of loving on that scale on our own, ever. I don't think we'll ever be called to, but that is what we should emulate. Right. So how can we learn to express that kind of love for those whom we deem undeserving or don't love us back. I mean, is it hard to love someone who doesn't love you back? Yeah, you need the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you need the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to love somebody who hates you and is open about it. It can be really hard. Right, so how do we learn to express that love? Because notice, he doesn't say just love them, but express the love. It's pastor. I think it's really difficult for me to, to muster up a feeling of love. Sometimes I don't even know what that is, right? 
what is the feeling of love. But I, I think with the examples we have here, when he when James is addressing the church, he's looking at how they're treating them. When we look at this this in Matthew 5, again, it was how God is treating them. Not so much, you know, so I think God's asking us to live above our feelings towards somebody. Mm-hmm. Well, we might we might look at somebody and be like, ah, not somebody I want to be out there. But yeah, if they have a need, we're going to serve them just like we would serve our best. Yeah. Or just like we would serve the one that's closest to us. So I think it's it's rising above our feelings of the situation and doing expre- expressions of love practically is what God calls us to do. Absolutely. And I think if if you've attended many of our studies, you know that I do not advocate that you live by feelings. I believe Christians should have feelings. I mean, God made us feeling beings, right? It's normal for us to have feelings, good feelings and bad feelings. You should feel bad when something bad happens, right? It would be very weird if you felt good when something bad happens. Then you've, you've got some other issues that probably need to be attended to. But you should not be governed by your feelings, right? Your feelings towards other people. Um, you know, I can honestly say as a teacher in a public school, some kids push my buttons, right? Yeah. They, they do it deliberately to try to get a reaction, but I can't stop loving those kids. I still have to give them the same respect, attention, and still try to teach them even though they're pushing those buttons. Uh, and that's a daily thing. But I can't do that on my own, right? If I tried to go in there under my own power and do that as just a mere man, I probably wouldn't, I might make it through one day, but I don't think, I don't think I'd make it through a whole semester. I doubt it very seriously. Uh, That's something you need God's grace. You need to recognize that that's in you and there's nothing wrong with you having those feelings, but you just have to say, God, you know, I don't want this to come out. This is not what I want them to see. I want them to see you. How can I show you to them and not what is in here? And how can you remove that? He can remove it. But again, it's well, I believe what the pastor says. We need to act the way we know we should be acting and not just giving into those feelings. All right. And which brings us to the next question. And we've talked a lot about surrender earlier this year. So why is, in the end, complete self-surrender and death to self the only answer? If I'm trying to do this on my own power, how long can I last? Um, I think everybody different. I think God works things for the good. Like, like if you're trying to do everything on your own, you can put in the trials to show you that it's not going to happen on our own. You know, that we're doing a trial to have to trust him more. Um, I think surrender and self-surrender is the only answer. Yeah. I think uh, we've all heard the phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. As mere humans, right, we have limits on what we can take. If you're trying to deal with people who don't like you, people who hate you, people who treat you poorly, and you're trying to do it on your own power, you're going to hit that point where that straw is going to break your back. And then you're going to have probably a very bad reaction on our own. We don't know where that limit is. Some people are naturally more patient than other people. Um, But I have seen people who I thought were virtual saints hit that breaking point because they were doing it on, and they've said on their own that they felt it coming and they should have gotten help from somewhere, but they thought they could handle it on their own. Um, And that can be a big problem. The only way to really fix that is to acknowledge that, Hey, I, I can't do it on my own. I have to have help. Uh, We're not going to go into a lot of detail on this because we spent a whole study on surrender. I think we spent a couple of months on that. 
so if you're watching online, you can find those studies and there's plenty of information there. We won't spend a lot of time on it tonight. Just understand on your own, you can't do this. You cannot love your neighbors the way God wants you to love your neighbors without his help. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into the law. It was love and the law was our title for this week. So we're going to look at James 2, verses 10 and 11. So we're just going down the next two verses. And uh, we're going to compare these to some texts in the New Testament. And we're going to see if we can figure out exactly what law this is that he's talking about when he says the whole law. So starting with verse 10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, based on those two texts, what law is James talking about? The Ten Commandments, right? So when he's talking here about the whole law, he's only referencing the laws that were written in stone by the finger of God. That's all he's referencing. So let's look at some of these other texts and see what laws they address. So there's quite a few on here. Um, we'll start Matthew 5, 18, 19. I guess we could just go around the room. There's enough here, I think, for virtually everyone to read one. Um, who wants to start? We'll just kind of go around this way or we can go around that way. Faster start? All right, then we'll just go around that way. All right. Go ahead, Pastor. Matthew 5, 18 and 19. For a German being to pity you, though heaven and earth half away, one job, one fiddle, will by no means have in the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of these least, uh, one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. All right. So here. Now, we've got our options here are whole law, law of love, or both. So, first of all, what law is Jesus talking about here? Ten Commandments. All right, Ten Commandments. He actually used the word commandments. He's talking about not one jot or tittle shall pass away, so there'll be no changes. Right. Until heaven passes away. When's heaven going to pass away? Never. Never. <laughs> right? Never. All right. So that's the, so it's talking about the Ten Commandments, which James referred to as the whole law. But what's the law of love? The law that Christ has written on our heart. The law, the law that Christ has written on our heart. We've heard of the Ten Commandments referred to as the law of liberty. Have we ever heard them referred to as the law of love? Would that be kind of a different way to, to view them? Just a different way to view it, yeah. Yeah. I mean... Well, isn't the, the, the summarization of the commandments, love the Lord your God with all our heart? Yes. Love your neighbor and yourself. Yes, Jesus did say that, yeah. right? He says on, on that, all the commandments are hung, right? Yeah. It's all based on love. So could we classify this as law of love? Yes. Yeah. If you're acting according to these laws, right? The first four are all about honoring God, showing respect for God, loving God. The, the last six are all about our relationships with each other. If you're living those laws in your life, how are you treating other people? With love, right? With love, right? So interesting way to look at the Ten Commandments is not just the law of liberty, it's the law of love. Let's look at the next verse, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, and see if we can continue down that train of thought um, coming over this way. Daisy's got it? Okay. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on to these two commandments. It's like you guys knew what the very next text was going to be that we read. <laughs> right? Uh, it is on the screen. But still, 
the fact that you tied that together before we read the text was a great thing. So I know you're reading your Bibles. That's great. All right, so here he's referencing what we just said, right? Those Ten Commandments, right? The first four are about God, last six are about man, and he says, and it's all about love. All right, so let's go to Romans 13, 8 through 10. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not. You shall not steal, you shall not. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbors as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. All right. Paul makes it pretty clear, don't you think, that obeying the commandments is an act of love, right? Treating people according to the commandments is treating them with love. Right, that's my 10 minute warning just went off. All right, let's go get uh, Galatians 3.10. And Vincent's got it, okay. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to, to perform. All right, so that one's a little bit different than the text we've been reading. What is that text saying? When it's talking about those under the law or those cursed? That's right. If, if the law is their only hope, they're, 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 they're done for. If the law is the only hope, yeah. Because are any of us able to keep the law on our own? No. No, right? We've all transgressed the law at some point in our time. There's not a person in here who hasn't sinned, right? We we all have. I'm not going to ask you to name them. I, I'm not really interested in hearing all that. <laughs> and, and I'm sure you don't really want to list them all out. I know I don't. Um but we, we all would be guilty, right? So if you're under the law, right? So you're not relating to that law in a relationship of love here, right? You're looking at this as almost in fear, right? The law has something on you because that love piece is missing. Let's look at Galatians 5.3. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision. He is out. All right. So this one also, circumcision was what kind of law? Was that something God wrote in stone? No. No, that was a ceremonial law. It was symbolic and it identified people as being Jews, right? It identified them as being uh, part of the Jewish nation. Now, was there any point once the word went out to the Gentiles and they were joining the fold, was there any need for them to go through that process to show that they were children of Abraham? No. No, right? There was no need for that. All right, but he's pointing out here that, so when he says this, that uh, if they are circumcised, they become debtors to keep the whole law and he's using the term whole law here is he talking about just the ten commandments no no yeah circumcision pinpoints this as a ceremonial law so it says if you're going to try to keep this one ceremonial law then you're tying yourself down to try to keep all the ceremonial laws now, do you know how many ceremonial laws there were, Pastor? I, I know there were more than 600. <laughs> and they, they made extras, too. They made extras, yes. So pretty measured. Yeah, I mean, it got down to where they would sew boxes on their clothing, so they, which because they couldn't carry packages or something on the Sabbath, but they could had a box sewed to your clothing. I'm like, aren't you carrying that? But 
a lot of them didn't make any sense at all. And Jesus, uh, Jesus did not feel obligated to be bound by those ceremonial laws. Uh, and that caused some strife between him and Pharisees. All right. So, and I'd like to point out the other one. Um, we were looking at earlier when you used the term debtor or owe, when he's talking about owing your neighbors, he said, what was, don't be in debt to anyone, but only owe them what? Love. love. love, right? So love is something we owe our neighbors, right? It's something we're expected to give. Right. Sorry, I didn't hit that point when we were on that verse. And the last one here, Galatians 5.14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All right, so he gets back down to it again. Now, this time he is stressing the relationship between other people, right? The horizontal relationship, not, not the vertical. Right? But to love your neighbor as yourself. All right, so we can see that all the way through here, you know, James is not the only author that connects love and the law. It's kind of, we see uh, Paul doing it. We see it in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, you can go back to the Old Testament, and you'll actually see it back there as well. All right. But in Bible times, and one of the reasons James had to make a point of this, for devout Jews in Bible times, one cannot really claim to keep the law without a commitment to keeping all the laws found in the books of Moses. Oh, I asked you the question earlier. It's actually here on the screen. Eventually, 613 separate laws were identified. Of those laws, 248 were positive laws. Positive being ones that actually were beneficial to follow. We're thinking a lot of the health laws, things of that nature. And 365 were negative laws. Now, these were laws that were actually hard to follow. Things that made it tough to actually function and were counterproductive, you know, like the sewing the box on your clothing thing, or the the Sabbath, you can only walk so many steps on a Sabbath, um, which was odd. So you, a lot of the Jewish villages, the size were there, because the people on the outer edge, they were about as far as you could go and still get to the synagogue and back without violating the Sabbath law. So the villages didn't get any bigger because they couldn't walk any further. It was it was weird. There was a lot of strange strange laws. Uh, traveling all over the place. They were supposed to be reunited as a family, and so that's where it came up in Leviticus, you know. And then they just kind of add on. That means, you know, you can't do more than so many. Yeah. They started adding restrictions to what they were saying. And that was a great thing at the beginning. You know. Sabbath, can't do this, can't do that, can't do that. And so that was a positive thing. You can take anything and you can look at negative or positive. And it was a very positive thing. And Sabbath was a delight to spend as a family together and not. I think about uh, sometimes when someone new comes into the church uh, and they start observing the Sabbath for the first time, how many times do we start off with a list of things they can't do? Did we do that to you, Rodney? No. Thank God. <laughs> I didn't think we did. I was trying to remember. I didn't think we did. Uh, we didn't do that to you either, Vincent, did we? Okay, good. Great. <laughs> We're consistent at this church, at least. Um, but I have seen that, and I have heard that from other people before, that you can't do that. I've tried never to tell someone what they can't do. I try to offer up positive suggestions. If you're looking for something that you can do on the Sabbath, things that will honor God. Uh, but really, I like to think that the choice of how you act on the Sabbath, that's between you and God. It's not really my business. And I'm going to keep my nose out of your business uh, as much as possible. Now, as an elder, I do have to sometimes say something if it becomes an issue. But, uh, you know, for, for a new believer, that should not be a topic that we get into. A list of things you cannot do. Now, of course, if they're trying to do it here at church, you know, 
that's a different story because that affects other people. But if we look about what Jesus taught about these laws, I'm going to have to wrap things up here. Um, did he teach that these ceremonial laws were something that we should still be following? Now, he, he mentioned to many times to the Pharisees that they were burdening the people with burdens that God did not intend for them to have. And that in many ways, these extra laws that they were putting on them were actually coming between the people and God. If we look um, at what they were trying to do, the Jews were at that time were trying to obey all these laws out of obligation not out of love, right? And that was actually setting up barriers uh, to Jesus' work. I mean, here God came down in the flesh to talk to them, and they were so concerned over obeying all these laws, 613 we saw, that they were ignoring God in the flesh. All right, which brings me to a question. We're going to end on this one. I might have time for just a few comments, but... Think about for yourself how much of your obedience comes from your love for God and others and how much from a sense of obligation. And to be honest, is there a point when we maybe start off with a sense of doing it out of an obligation while we're developing that love relationship? Now, so the question here then, is working from obligation always wrong? Or are there times when it's right? It's a learning period. Some. Sometimes a learning period. So when you first learn something, uh, when something is revealed to you for the first time, like when you first learn about the Sabbath, initially, uh, for some people, that becomes an obligation, initially. But if they're truly seeking that relationship with God, I don't think that stage lasts very long. I think they get through that very quickly. Your question is cast on because it says it's working from obligation. So right away you're looking at it as a work that you're doing. Which the Philip to be doing is falling in love with the Lord. And when you fall in love with the Lord, you're not because you are doing things because you just fall in love. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Surrender to him. Yeah, I like I like that. All well, those old things that you you got in Leviticus and stuff for the ceremonial in Matthew twenty three, Jesus says, "All that for what did you serve that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say do not." They went about how they find heavy rooms. So there's a lot of stuff in Leviticus that is applicable. Actually, today, for health reasons, um, you know, you work with to mix um, different types of fabric together, and they proved you in stage. When you mixed them together, it made a man weak. Okay, so, you know, Bob will wear a 100% cotton shirt, and it's much better than your, your polyester mixes and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. like polyester. <laughs> so is that a Ten Commandment? No. no. But you can learn an awful lot mm -hmm. from what the the original stuff back in the Metis was uh, about what what you might call ceremonial laws. Okay. It was just it was just advice on how to be healthy and how to have an abundant life. I would like to point out that of those six hundred and thirteen laws, there were two hundred and what did it say, two hundred and forty eight that were positive. Laws like those health laws, uh, I think back to during the Civil War uh, when uh, patients, you know, when they, soldiers would get out there and they get shot, a lot of them died after surgery because doctors were going from patient to patient to patient without ever washing their hands and just treating one after the other after the other on the battlefield. Uh, and I forget who did the study on that, but someone said, hey, you know, you should be washing your hands between patients. And when they did that, that one change, the death rate plummeted. It went down just the survival rate, was just washing hands. And he got that from reading the Bible because it was it referenced that. I think that was in Leviticus. 
Um, I remember reading that in, uh, I forget what book that was in. It was a history book. And I thought that that was interesting. Where people say that there's not relevant information in the Bible. There's a lot in there. And a lot of those laws that uh, Moses gave were useful. So I don't want to discard and say all these things were good. A lot of the times we talk about the ceremonial laws that Jesus did away with. Those were the laws dealing with the sacrificial system. Because those all pointed to him. And once he died on the cross, there was no further purpose in those sacrifices. Um, but I agree with what you said. If you're working, keyword working, from obligation because you're trying to earn approval or earn salvation, then that is a problem. That, I believe, would be considered a sin in God's eyes. Now, if you're new to the faith, right, you love God, but you're not real sure about the Sabbath thing, and you're doing it because, you know, hey, God wants me to do that. I'm expected to do that. Is that really working from obligation? If your intent is to honor God the way he asked you to honor him. I mean, think about it. From trust. That's from trust, right? It may be a little uncomfortable, a little awkward. Yeah. So that may not have been the best example for me to use, but I do agree uh, with what you said about working, because that keyword is work, from obligation as a means to earn something that's wrong. We're going to have to end it there. Uh, I did have uh, just one or two more slides about being judged by the law, but I think you all got the point. The law is about love. If you live that life through love, then you can expect to be judged with mercy, which is what we all need. All right. We'll close this out with prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this lesson tonight and the opportunity to see that the laws that you have given us are all based on love. And these laws are guides for us to express our love and show our loves to you and to others. Now, Lord, we know on our own we are not capable of keeping these laws and showing that love. We ask you to send your spirit to be with us. Help us to reveal that love to others in the way we live our lives. Lord, we thank you for asking these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Right, just a reminder, no study next week.